Mr. Layton and fellow students of Theosophy. The Theosophical Society whose guests we are this morning is, as you doubtless know, established in many countries of the world and therefore includes members of it's each of the great world religions. But since, however, many of us here have been brought up within the fold of Christianity, as my title indicates, my closing lecture this morning, delivered here in Crotona, concerns chiefly the revered founder of the Christian faith. And so, friends, with the utmost reverence, we turn our thoughts to our Lord Jesus Christ himself, to the great story of his life, and to the Christian religion of which he was and still is the founder. As is inevitable, I suppose, with so vast a theme, certain difficulties present themselves. And for the student of Christianity, amongst these are the numerous and differing guises in which the great central figure and so Christianity itself are presented. For example, in passage after passage, the pure humanity of Jesus is insisted upon. It, upon. He is born, you remember, as a helpless child. He must flee from an oppressor. He is rebuked by his mother and futilely is tempted by Satan to self-indulgence and pride. We learn, don't we, that he is said to have suffered the purely human weaknesses of weariness, sorrow, shrinking from pain, shedding tears as of disappointment over the non-responsiveness of the people of Jerusalem and yes whilst on the cross he experienced physical thirst it is said during that crucifixion he is said also to know the temporary loss of his identity with his divine and immortal source, his unity with God the Father. True, all of these limitations were born with heroic fortitude and his will was always in the ascendant. Nevertheless, in his bodily nature, he is regarded and presented as a purely human being and to have endured purely human sufferings. Then, as of course you all know, then in strange contrast to these very human experiences, our Lord Jesus Christ is also portrayed as one upon whom at his baptism there descended the spirit of the holiest. He is also represented as a divine being in his own nature, as possessed of and constantly wielding deific power. He can you remember, 
he can render himself invisible. Or as the text has, he disappeared from their midst. He can walk on water, change water to wine, and heal those apparently incurable, both there in his actual presence and at a distance. And his miracles, of course, are remarkable, are they not? He, he duplicated and multiplied bread and fish so successfully as to provide food for 5,000 from a very small original supply. And yes, left more food afterwards than before. What else? Well, he projected a coin into the stomach of a swimming fish. And he causes a miraculous draught of fishes to appear to be present in the water, which had been fruitlessly fished throughout the preceding night. And even more wonderful, should the gospel story be read literally, even more wonderful was the power by which he brought his long crucified dead body to life, freed it from a sealed rock-built tomb guarded by Roman sentinels. And after having be dead and buried three days, you remember, and three nights, he reappears in the world of men in solid bodily form that can even be touched as by doubting Thomas. A most illuminating episode. And then he's levitated on the surface of water, and finally, amidst great lights, up to heaven, at the final event of his life, which was his ascension. So, despite certain quite human traits, the founder of our faith is obviously far more than man. For the Lord Jesus Christ is presented to us as veritably the Son of God upon earth. And then you remember, as philosopher and sage, he not only reveals the sublimest wisdom, but he proves himself to be an acute debater putting the cleverest Jewish brains to defeat, avoiding legal traps, and even causing his opponents to be caught in their own snares. And above and beyond these human and superhuman traits and powers, our Lord is also, and at the same time, clearly regarded by the evangelists and apostles, especially St. John, to be no normal habitant of our globe at all. He is indeed presented as a divine visitant here, a descent of God upon earth a manifestation in human form of no less a being than the creator of the cosmos itself and all that it contains and will ever produce. For the evangelist then, and especially for St. John, our Lord was the Word by whom all things were made. 
For he begins, you remember, in the beginning was the Word. Clearly then, the student of the Christian religion is, and we must face and confess this, if we are to solve the mystery at all, we are in the presence of a profound mystery. And if we feel ourselves so moved, we must seek to understand the founder of our religion, who on some occasions appears to be quite human, a man amongst men, and on others superhuman, and yet is in essence and reality wholly divine. Is that the whole difficulty? No, I think not. For the, the mystery is deepened, is it not, by the writings of St. Paul amongst the apostles who present still another and entirely different and even more mystifying concept of our Lord Christ. Not only the external, historically existent superhuman personage, not only a divine manifestation in human form is the Jesus Christ of St. Paul. For, as his various writings reveal, for St. Paul, our Lord is also a deific power and presence, latent, embryonic, within all mankind, waiting to be born. Yes, for St. Paul, our Lord is not only that superhuman being, he is a deific power within each and every one of us, one of which we can be aware and which is to be born, come to life and even rule us having done so. So, in the Christian scriptures, the birth of the Lord Christ is not only regarded as an historical event which occurred at a certain place, Bethlehem, du during a single hour of time, but the nativity is also an interior, ever-present and continuing reality. A universal nativity that can become as immediate as the birth of one's own son. An indescribable interior spiritual experience. The birth of the Christ within. Yes, as I said those words, the writing of St. Paul came to my mind. I think he wrote, for I travail in birth again, that the Christ be born in you. In consequence, of all these different approaches, one might be forgiven for asking whether the Lord Jesus Christ, as founder of a world faith, can possibly at the same time have been all of these other great and wondrous beings and principles. And some of us, questioning people, though many of us are. Some of us might even ask the question, did the creative word actually become manifest as Jesus Christ for some 30 years? Did the Logos appear in Palestine some 1977 or so years ago? And we answer yes. 
But if so, then, how can that brief self-revelation by the Supreme Deity be identifiable with the spiritual nature in every human being, and indeed in the whole of the universe. As I thus put it before you, and think of it with you, I, I, I see that this is the problem before the student of the human faith. And yes, such is our study together this morning. Well, what can I contribute? Well, the method I have chosen is to consider separately each of these three aspects of the Christ. The cosmic, the mystic, and the historical. First then, what do we learn from our Bible of the great cosmic being? The Word made flesh of St. John, the supreme deity by whom all things were made. Well, this is clear as we read our Bible. We find at once the identification by the evangelists and the apostles, especially St. John, of the Lord Jesus Christ with the creative logos or cosmic word. L allow me to just quote some of their remarkable phrases. The first few verses of the Gospel according to St. John. For instance, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And yet, our Lord Jesus himself identifies himself with that creative deity. Here are some further quotations from again St. John. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And again, he said, I and my Father are one. And by seeing me, he said, you shall see and know the Father. And St. John goes on summing it up thus, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And yes, St. Paul repeated this, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Galatians chapter 2 verse 9. And our Lord himself clearly knew of his own pre-existence as the creative deity, for he said these words, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee, before the world was. John 17, 5. And in the book of Revelations, our Lord is made to say, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. 
Such then, as students, we are in the presence of the cosmic Christ. And such is the image of the Supreme Being who is revealed in the New Testament as none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom our religion was born. And then we are presented with the mystical Christ. The Christ in you of St. Paul. And as various quotations indicate, the historical Jesus is in no way divided from the cosmic Christ, the second aspect of the Blessed Trinity, God the preserving power. Indeed, the two are one. And the divine presence, the mystical Christ within, is that same presence, that same power, inherent within the depths of the soul of every human being. You and I and every one of us in the world from the beginning are not only just these physical bodies with their capacities but at the heart, at the very spiritual heart with other religions also. The authors of our New Testament particularly assure us there does exist, however embryonic as far as our consciousness is concerned, I'll come to that later, however embryonic as far as our consciousness is concerned, there does exist with each, within each and every one of us that same divine presence. And I find myself wondering as I share these thoughts with you, whether perhaps this is not the real goal of religion, to discover and bring to light life throughout all our deeds. This divine presence inherent within the depths of the soul of every human being. Yes, that's strictly in accordance with Christian teaching, which goes on, um, we may presume, to state that as evolution proceeds, this divine presence becomes increasingly active within mankind. And this knowledge helps greatly in solving the problem of the cosmic and the mystic natures of both the Lord Christ in his nature and power and the experience which an individual may have in the heart of his own being, in the midst of prayer and devotion, at times of elevation, of being one with both the Creator and his manifested Son on earth. Yes, I think I might say here that really is the goal and I will refer to it before I close. So now let us move on from this mystical element in Christianity towards a study of the mystic Christ. Again, St. Paul, no, how did he put it? Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Indeed, St. Paul, as you doubtless know, stressed this same idea that a divine presence did exist in the innermost heart of every human being and he encouraged all to seek there for the great discovery. He wrote, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I travel in birth again, that the Christ be formed in you. 
I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, said St. Paul. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Rather personal, but intimate association with the divine. And I already quoted, may I say again, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Yes, and further, I remember, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you. Apparently, this presence is of enormous importance to every human being. For in Colossians 1.27, St. Paul wrote, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I travel in birth again until the Christ be formed in you. I presume that must mean has come to your consciousness, born or formed to become a living experience in mind and heart. And our Lord Christ himself, you remember, assured his disciples, and so ourselves, I, a wonderful phrase now, friends, I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. One of the most wonderful texts I, I have come to believe in our whole Bible, where our Lord himself addresses us through the disciples. I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. And might we perhaps here remind ourselves that this view of Christian doctrine, of its founder, harmonizes with theosophy, which does teach that the creator of the universe is not separate from, not away in some high heaven from that which he has created, for the supreme creator, or the spirit, if you like, of all life, is also incarnate, both within his universe and within every being and every person within it. And according to theosophy, the wisdom of the ages, God is to be regarded not only as the transcendent deity beyond and above of all creation, but <coughs> also, and how important, friends, but also as the imminent deity, the omnipresent ensouling divinity within all that he has made. Yes, in a phrase, the God within. Well, here again, we find support in our own Bible, which does indeed include this highly mystical view of both our Lord Christ himself and of his presence within every human being, the Christ within. Allow me to share one or two such affirmations. I've already mentioned one with which John opens his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In him was life, and the, and the life was the light of men. Modern Writers have followed this through, haven't they? And some of the poets and others have caught 
the vision and put it in their own more modern words. Do you remember Angelus Silesius? The Austrian mystic. Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born and not within thyself, thy soul will be forlorn. The cross on Golgotha thou lookest to in vain, unless within thyself it be set up again. Going rather far, but the same central idea. And one of your poets whom I've already quoted and have been privileged to meet, Angela Morgan, she put this briefly, but I think very impressively, if I may say so, in her little poem, Passports. Oh, thou thy cry at heaven's gate, God must admit thee soon or late, Thy passport, saints could ask no more. His image at thy very core. And so if I had time, which I have not, I could share so many other wonderful sayings showing that the miracle of miracles is that mortal man is made divine. And so, from the New Testament and many other sources, we learn that the cosmic, the mystic and the historic Christ were united, were manifested in one supremely great being, who was the Lord Jesus of Nazareth sometimes referred to as the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, applying this to our own lives, surely this divine presence above, within the universe, and within each and every one of us, means that present and ceaselessly at work within each and every one of us is that very divine life and power which has been beautifully named the Christ indwelling. And it has also been said, hasn't it? Though I have no notes, but the thought just occurs to me that all that is said to have happened in the Gospels to our Lord Jesus Christ outwardly, all of it is also descriptive of inward experiences in the human soul, through which men and women, yes, and even children pass throughout their lives. And we all have our exaltations upon the mount and our temptations in the presence of Satan in the wilderness. We don't always say, get thee behind me, Satan, when self, self-gain and self-pride cause us to make a fuss of ourselves so foolishly. But we all go on eventually to recover and eventually to ascend in full consciousness into union with our highest. So, these strange accounts from our Bible, they are not restricted to the geographical location of the great teacher, Palestine, but are ceaselessly continuing to occur in many different and far-ranging lands and places and hearts here upon earth. 
And so we are taught that the Christ nature or the word by which all things were made and that was brought to fullest manifestation in the Lord Jesus Christ. This will, this will in due course become a consciously experienced presence within every human being and as did the Lord Christ will ascend in fully highest development, in clouds of glory, consciously into the presence of the divine. And this process is going on, whether we recognize it or not. And you and I, and everything that happens to us, and all our experiences, happiness giving and sorrow producing, our successes and our failures, are all repeating the great stories of the saviors of the world. They show that we too are, as it were, divine beings, slowly in the becoming. There are some further, but I won't keep you too long, beautiful <coughs> quotations illustrating what I just found myself advancing. St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians has a verse that I and Sandra and I like so much, referring to our Lord as an inward presence. For he is our peace who hath made us one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. For he is our peace who hath made us both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. The human and the superhuman being which we are. And in closing then, may we consider ways in which all this might become a living and vital experience to us. Is there anything we can do in which to translate all these wonderful descriptions and quotations and stages of uplifted consciousness and life? Is there any way which we might follow which would help us still further along the path which doubtless we are all doing our best to tread? Well, of course, I presume the answer would be given that first of all, yes, by expressing the love of God in practical servants, service, ever performed in his name and for whom one's and yes and to whom one's whole life has been given and for whom one wholly lives. Yes, as I say that, I find my interior conviction strong. It's an interior process of giving one's whole life up with joy with privilege, with humility to the attainment of realized union with our Lord Christ, with that Christ presence in all and in loving service, dedicating ourselves to the well-being of all. So I suppose I could answer our question, can we do something more to know this mysterious teaching of our religion? I ventured to put, by sincerely, deeply caring, even longing indeed, to know that as St. Paul put it, and as our Lord would put it, I am the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in me.
a prayer, a meditation, an inward aspiration. But deeply caring, friends, not a mere passing thought. Reminds me of a story. A yogi with his disciple was touring apparently in India. And they came to a rather deep ford, which they crossed on foot. And the disciple had been continually asking his yogi master, please tell me, Lord, how can I find God? How can I possibly find God? The master was silent. But when they came within the ford, he took the young disciple's head, apparently, and held it down under the water for rather a long time. Then let him up. And then when they had reached the other side, the master said to him, When I held your head under the water like that, for what did you most deeply care? Master, I cried out with my whole being for one thing, which was air. Ah, said the teacher, and when you come to the stage, when similarly you earnestly with your whole being cry out for realization of God, you will attain. So I ventured to put deeply caring. Is there a kind of yoga for us as Christians? We know the Orientals, the Indians have their yoga. Does any kind of yoga for us exist? Yes, it does. And I close with a short, very short presentation of what we might, if we like, call a yoga of prayer. There are said to be, I'm not going to be technical, friends, but there are said to be four stages of prayer. And each of them is supposed to lead in regular order to the goal of realized oneness with God and through Him with all that live. All one. Each of these various stages is designed to produce certain effect. And the whole forms part of a kind of graded method, it seems to me, which might prove to be very helpful and is doubtless to many of us. What are the four stages? Well, they call the first one Simple mental prayer. In brackets I noticed in the book I'm drawing on, partly only, natural stage of prayer. Fervent, inward, self, withdrawing into the presence of the Lord. They call it the prayer of simplicity. Or oh, it's rather beautifully put in one book. The prayer of simple reward. The individual is seeking apparently only one thing. Simply to know the divine presence within. And what is the second stage of prayer? Well, it's called... The prayer of quiet, pure contemplation, where the will is absorbed in effort to attain to the same wonderful spiritual experience. Upwards, it says, and inwards, the soul passes to the spiritual passion of oneness with the life in all that exists. And this leads to the third stage, which is called the prayer of union. This is described as perfect contemplation. 
Here one finds will, memory, and understanding are all swallowed up in God. Novice phrase, isn't that? May I repeat it? In the prayer of union, will, memory, and understanding are all swallowed up in God. It's too exalted, too beyond the limited power of the brain to receive any definiteness. And they go on to the fourth stage, <coughs> which they call, and these are the Christian mystics, the prayer of rapture or ecstasy. This stage is to be approached with all A-W-E. This stage of the prayer of rapture or ecstasy of experienced union with the divine is to be approached with awe. For God is said to enter the soul and manifest himself to it openly by the gift of his holy presence. I was reminded as I found that, and here I am about to close, of that wonderful description of the same ecstasy by St. Augustine. One of my favorites, which I am happy to share with you. If the tumult of the world were hushed, hushed the images of earth and the waters, and of air, and hushed also the poles of heaven, yea, the very soul silence, together with all dreams and revelations, and every tongue and every sigh still. Then, says St. Augustine, then we might hear his word, not through any tongue of flesh, not through any angel's voice, nor sound of thunder, but his very self without thee. Again, since we, our friends, have students together, and I'm about to close and withdraw. If the tumult of the world were hushed, hushed the images of earth and of waters and of air and hushed also the poles of heaven yea the very soul silenced together with all dreams and revelation and every tongue and every sigh still then <clears throat> we might hear his word not through any tongue of flesh or angel's voice nor sound of thunder, but his very self without thee. Well, friends, as thus we have studied together certain aspects of our own religion, and I've accentuated the mystical. May we not be completely assured that both as a divine personage, a divine personage, and as a spiritual principle, our Lord does unfailingly keep his promise uttered as he left us, physically only, ascending into heaven. And I close with his word. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Thank you.